it's working. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Veterans Breakfast Club special event where we're streaming Scramble the Sea Wolves with a documentary by Jeff and Shannon Arbeo, who are with us here this evening, and then a conversation with those who live the history of um, the Navy helicopter operations of the Mekong Delta between 1966 and 1972. I am very grateful to Jeff and Shannon for this collaboration, for their willingness to spend time with us and to screen the film and be part of the conversation with the filmmaker and also with the veterans who live this uh, history, as I said. Jeff and Shannon, how are you? We're doing fantastic. Doing great, doing absolutely great. And you're joining us from sunny California, correct? Yes, except it was raining here today. Oh, good, that makes me feel better. That makes me feel better because I'm in Pittsburgh and it's been raining like all week. So uh, at least you guys are, you know, suffering too. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and we have a lot of new people here. I, I think a lot of people who haven't joined a Veterans Breakfast Club event before, the first question they'll probably have is, what the heck, Breakfast Club? This is, you know, this is the evening, this is the afternoon. What? Uh, yeah, that we started 15 years ago in 2008 with 30 World War II veterans here in the South Hills of Pittsburgh and simply had an event in a hotel ballroom where the veterans could share stories. And it was a breakfast event and that's how we started. And so we kept the name Veterans Breakfast Club. But the whole key is really just that, that welcoming openness to veterans, encouraging, coaxing them to share stories of service. And we do it in person, mostly here in Western Pennsylvania. And we do it online every week, every Monday night at 7 p.m. We have our what we call our VBC happy hour, where we have different guests and different subjects and different veterans sharing stories. I have, have been with the Veterans Breakfast Club since the very beginning, and I am not a veteran, and neither is Sean Hall, my co-host here and our director of programming. Uh, we're the ones, and, and neither are uh, Jeff and Shannon. That's why I feel a uh, you know, a kinship with you two, because you're not veterans, and yet you have the same fascination with this history, the same fascination with these veterans, the same interest in the stories, and you've dedicated yourselves to capturing these stories. And so what we're going to do tonight, I just want to let people know, the plan is we're going to screen Scramble the Sea Wolves. It's a 90-minute film. Uh, I will be kind of sharing my screen, and we'll be, we'll be, we'll watch it together. And then uh, at the end, we will take an hour and have a conversation about the film, um, about the Sea Wolves, about the history, and about and with the veterans who lived what the film depicts. And, and the, many of the veterans who are in the film are with us here this evening. Before we get to that, I do want to emphasize and let people know that um, Jeff and Shannon are hard at work on the sequel. I think it's kind of like a sequel, a sequel to Scramble the Sea Wolves. It is a documentary on the Mobile Riverine Force. You, you guys cannot get yourselves out of the Mekong Delta. I, I mean, you're, you know, Scramble the Sea Wolves and now the Mobile Riverine Force. I know that you're hard at work uh, on that film and that you uh, are looking to get it through post-production. Um, it, it, it'll probably be, uh, it, where will it screen? Where, it, will it be like a, a PBS documentary? Well, already we've been picked up by KPBS here in San Diego. And what we did with Scramble the Sea Wolves, we were picked up by KPBS, and then we went through NIDA and got um, national distribution. Shannon knows a little bit more yeah. about that part. That's what she worked on a lot, so. Yeah, so it ended up airing on over 350 different PBS stations across the country. And, you know, it's our, it's our mission to bring the story of the Mobile Riverine Force as it was with Scramble the Seals into the hearts and homes of Americans from coast to coast. So we're equally committed to doing the same with the Mobile Riverine Force. And, you know, as Jeff said, it's already been picked up by KPBS and uh, the best is yet to come. 
And that's how I got to know you is we did two programs with you and with the veterans that you connected us with who were members of the Mobile Riverine Force. It was a great education for me, a great education for everybody else in the Veterans Breakfast Club to have those veterans. And I know some are with us here tonight and some continue to join us, uh, Cliff Pfeiffer and others. Um, and what I thought I would do is is before we get to Scramble the Ski Wolves is play just a trailer to the film that you're working on, the Mobile River Reinforce, because again, you are still seeking support, uh, donations, uh, corporate underwriting, you know, any kind of assistance in getting this film through post-production. Uh, we were joking before we went live that anybody involved in this kind of <laughs> this kind of creative work, uh, you know, you're probably seeking some kind of like mental health professional who may be able to consult with you as you, you know, struggle to do it with a project this big. Um, but let's screen the Mobile River Reinforce uh, trailer and then talk a, just very briefly about how people could support it, and then we'll move on to Scramble the Sea Wolf. So here is the trailer. blend of the Navy and the Army actually worked pretty good. Most people think the Navy is big gray ships floating out in the middle of the ocean. They don't know about the brown water Navy. They called us the heavy patrol. When we realized we were the old reliables, we thought that was pretty cool. We were proud to be known as River Rats. First time since the Civil War that the Navy fought on rivers. The ASPB, as it was called, or Alpha Boat, put out the sweep gear and you'd have two of them on the, the leading the column of boats down the river, sweeping the, the river banks for uh, command detonated mines. The sweep gear was designed to rip the cable before the rest of the boats got there. We're going to live on Navy ships and we're going to move the whole battalion of the area of operation. The operations that we went out for on uh, at that point in time was probably the most dangerous thing you could do in the Navy. Heavy and slow. <laughs> Ask anyone. We weren't getting anywhere fast. The Viet Cong would fire at the boats, and then the boats would return fire, and all this is going on over your head. You didn't know what was on the other side of that nipper pole. You didn't know what was going to happen. And any day, you could be the casualty. The Navy moved the infantry around and such. We all had to work together for mutual survival. I think that the brotherhood created in battle is like none other. If you talk about brotherhood, we would have taken a bullet for each other. Most of the time when we carried troops, it was the 9th Infantry Division, but it wasn't always just the 9th Infantry Division. Sometimes we would go out by ourselves. Sometimes we carried Green Beret, Navy SEALs. Each tango boat would go out on a night mission, maybe at eight o'clock in the evening, and wouldn't come back until uh, four or five in the morning. One of the transits that we made was 19 hours. The Army provided uh, fire support, 305, 151 millimeter guns. The reason that the 9th Infantry Division was reactivated was the Viet Cong were in charge of the Mekong Delta and they brutalized the people. So we trained specifically to be part of the uh, troops to fight in the Delta. We became part of the Mobile River Ring Force. That's where the real deal was. Combat will change your mentality. You can't see them because they're in the ground. And you're standing knee deep in mud, sometimes the water halfway up your legs, you know, doing through this hot sun and stuff. You never get a chance to dry out, even in a dry season. There's no place to hide, but there's really no cover.
Oh, great stuff, Jeff and Shannon. Great. Those mud images just, oh, they get to me, the conditions under which these men had to fight. Um, I, I, the best way that people could support the... Oh, that's uh, that's my YouTube. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Um, the best way that people can support the project is Indiegogo. Is that the best? Oh, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay, there we go. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we got muted. So, um, yeah, Indiegogo would be a, the best way to do it right now. And I know Shannon has some more information about um, different ways that they could support us as well. Yeah, so Indiegogo is a great place for any individuals who want to make a, a personal contribution to the post production specifically. Um, there are the capabilities, though, through our um, fiscal sponsor to make a tax deductible donation. Uh, and as well, we're looking for corporate sponsors. So if you happen to be a business owner or know somebody that operates an organization and you're interested in underwriting opportunities through PBS. So there's really three different ways to contribute. And the fourth way to help us is to simply spread the word. Um, so all four of those, you know, means really help us kind of uh, get to the next point, which is a completed awesome documentary for these guys. And people could connect with you through your website, arbeoentertainment.com. I put the link here in the chat and you could repeat that also if you'd like. Jeff and Shannon, I put the link to the Indiegogo uh, fundraising campaign, which begins today. This is the launch this and we will be launch. promoting it and, and sharing it because it's such a great project. It's the Mobile River Reinforce was such an important and successful uh, part of the Vietnam War, and um, and you're the only people who have really documented it the way it should be documented on video. So thank you very much, and thank you also for again coming and sharing the story of Scramble the Sea Wolves. I know we have. Uh, I guess let, let me ask before we get uh, before we start the screening, which will be in just a minute, if we do have sea wolves with us. I believe we have several of them. Um, I believe uh, Barry Waluda. Rick McAmoyle, I'm going to ask you guys just to unmute if you want to just say hi. Um, I believe we have Pat Samuel. And yes, ma'am. Yes, ma hey, how are you? Okay. Glad Thank to be you. here. Thank you for joining us. And you are in the you're in the uh, film that we're going to be watching, correct? At towards the end, yeah. Towards the they they threw you in at the end. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, this is so neat. And we also, do we have uh, Rick Rasich? Is he with us too? I haven't seen Rick he here. He may not have been able to uh, join us tonight. Okay. Okay. Um, and Barry and Dick Barr. Maybe Dick Barr is with us. Barry. Barry oh, I, here he is. Dick Barr is here. And you, um, oh, Barry. Barry. Hey, yeah. Barry. Thanks for joining us. Thank you first, very first much <laughs> for sharing uh, some of your story. We're going to be talking with with Barry and uh, and Dick, I see that Dick is with us, and Pat, um, and other Sea Wolves after we screen the film. So, and we also have Jeff Arbeo said, uh, Mobile River Reinforce guys, and we, we, absolutely we do. And I do see um, Harry and Mike and and Cliff, of course. Uh, so let's start the screen, and then again we will. This is a ninety minute film. We'll watch it, and then we'll have a conversation with these veterans and with the filmmaker. So here we go. I don't know that's that's the right one. <laughs> Hold on a second. Can you believe it? I closed it. Oh. It's worth the wait. It's worth I had it all set up. I had it all. It was going to be the first time I ever had a seamless, perfectly timed transition. Um, so hold on a second. Let me. Ah, okay. That's how it always works, though, you know. I know. Gosh. Dang. Okay. All right. Here we go. When 
I got to Vietnam, I was a 19-year-old kid. When I left Vietnam, I was a 20-year-old man. If you didn't think on your feet real quick, you'd be laying on your back. We all trusted each other with our lives. Every detachment had a different mission. Contrary to what uh, the history books might say to you about Vietnam today, uh, this was a volunteer squadron. Three other outfit, Army and Air Force, they always they have a home back here in the States somewhere, and we don't. bullet came in that hit me, came in right here, and cut the wire to my mic, and on the back of my helmet was spelled KID, and it dotted the eye. Their life meant nothing if one of us was in trouble. They did what it took to get us out. But when we got there, we didn't have much of anything. Courage isn't the absence of fear, it's being scared out of your wits and doing your job. That's courage. We were the McHale's Navy of Vietnam, a cross between the Baba Black Sheep and McHale's Navy. It was well known that if you, if you got in trouble, you better know their frequency to call for the Sea Wolves, because we would come, whether it was two in the morning or uh, black and weather and rain, monsoon. You're never going to leave anybody on the ground. If you put them in there by God, you're going back and getting them, even if it costs you. just flew in horrendous conditions. We used to fly at night, 100 feet over the trees. Somebody shot us, we dropped a flare, and then rolled in and shot. For the first time in history, a unique helicopter squadron is established by the Navy. They're known as the HAL-3 Sea Wolves. Part of the Brownwater Navy, their mission is to provide close air support for the river patrol boats and riverine forces in the Mekong Delta, insertions and extractions of SEALs, Army and Special Ops. They had got all the old Army helicopters that they didn't want. And these Navy guys were patching them up and tying them together and making them work. Vietnam was jungle warfare, where the U.S. Army, Marines, and Air Force battled for control. Meanwhile, little is known of the war the Sea Wolves and the Brown Water Navy were fighting in the Delta. And yet, for five years, the approximately 2,600 maintainers, pilots, Gunners and support personnel that comprised the Sea Wolves would patrol the Delta, but they would remain forgotten in the early histories of the Vietnam War. The squadron was established and disestablished in Vietnam and never spent a day inside the United States. They were unlike any other squadron. They used hand me down Hueys and had few mechanical supplies, yet they volunteered for duty, operating from nine detachments with headquarters at Vung Tau and eventually Bin Tui, they became indispensable to the men they saved and the most decorated squadron in naval aviation history. Close to 50 years later, this is their story. The Mekong Delta is the southern quarter of Vietnam, where more than half of the South Vietnamese population live. The brown, muddy waters of the Mekong River twist and turn for 2,700 miles, emptying into the South China Sea. With heavy monsoon rains from the mountains of China through Laos and Cambodia, the slow-moving waters meander through thousands of canals, streams, and rivers, picking up nutrients and soil that create the perfect environment for growing rice. It was also the perfect environment for the North Vietnamese Army to smuggle arms. In February 1965, an Army observation plane was flying over the coast of South Vietnam and saw what he thought was an island moving. He went down for a closer observation and found that it was a cleverly disguised trawler. They stopped this thing, and it was just full of arms. 
But what scared them the most when is when they read the ship yog and found out this was like their 23rd trip. The Westmoreland said, where's the Navy? Where's the Navy? Well, the first ships to show up was the US Coast Guard in the summer of 65. By December 65, the first swift boats. This was called Task Force 115, Operation Market Time. Swift boats were a small inshore boat that could get close to the shoreline developed to interdict uh, the movement of arms and ammunition along the coastline. And they were very effective. They intercepted 12 trawlers in the next year or two. Ho Chi Minh decided the best way to get arms is this through my in-country trail, which they called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. 10 miles south of Saigon was one of the worst areas in Vietnam. It was called the Rung Sat Special Zone. It was 40 square miles of little canals and, and waterways, and there was no roads. And the Viet Cong thought of it as their home. We had one third of all war supplies were going down this Long Tao shipping channel. So the Navy was tasked that first, protect this shipping channel. And the sea wolves were sent there first also. This was the number one, you know, if they sink a ship on this harbor, they'll block all our transports for the next year. The US Navy countered by putting Task Force 116, the River Patrol, together. The Army was first assigned to protect us in the Long Tail, and we were having difficulties with them not wanting to fly at night or them running off to protect Army guys rather than staying with the Navy. So the Navy decided it was best to send their own helos in, and everybody was concentrating on keeping this shipping channel open, and everybody was taking hits. Everybody was losing men. They were blowing our boats out of the water. March 1966. The first 10 River Patrol boats, part of Task Force 116, would arrive in Vietnam and prepare for their first operational mission. Known as PBRs, the boats were small and maneuverable enough to conduct operations all along the waterways. The first patrol took place on April 10th, 1966, as River Squadron 5 went into action along the Long Tao River. They put river patrol boats in to patrol the rivers to stop the arms coming into Vietnam via the Delta area. When the PBRs discovered that they needed close air support, which was almost immediately, they couldn't get it from anyone else. The Air Force would tell them, we can be there in two weeks. And what they needed was instant rapid reaction. Admiral Zumwalt figured out that he was losing PBR and swift boat drivers faster than he could train them. So the two things that he came up with was first close air support, and second was an Agent Orange to defoliate the banks. And at that point in time, they were relying totally upon an Army mission in order to be able to take care of their air support and cover. The pilots for the Army, most of them were warrant officers and they didn't have a lot of instrument training. The Army had a problem with night flying because the gunships weren't equipped with radar altimeters to tell how high they were off the ground because we flew low level. Therefore, the river patrol boats, they couldn't get the support that they really wanted. The Army did a good job for us. They bailed my, my butt out a whole bunch of times out there in the daytime. It just at night is when we needed it, so they made the decision we've got to have Navy protecting Navy. So in bad weather, nighttime and dark, uh, they couldn't operate to help us, and that's when we got in trouble. That's when the SEALs got in trouble. Zumwalt actually told the Army that, hey, look, we don't have the aircraft you do, but if you'll give me the aircraft, I'll take over that mission requirement and we'll put our people in it. They took an existing squadron and formed three detachments. And the idea was to train them up and, uh, and have them provide the close air support until they could do something more substantial. And basically the Army trained them on spot. July, 1966. Four Navy detachments of HC-1 from Imperial Beach, California began to train with the Army's 197th Squadron. 
It became clear the PBRs were in constant danger of attack. Though maneuverable on water, they were sitting ducks for the enemy. Men were dying and boats were sinking without adequate air cover. Our brownwater Navy operation was the first time since the Civil War when we rolled in on a strike at a blistering 60 or 80 knots and you're looking at the guy shooting at you when the average person thinks of naval aviation they don't really think of direct contact we're not flying that high it's not like we're flying a few thousand feet or even a thousand feet we're flying a hundred you know hundred feet off the ground in a lot of times you can see them and they can see you got over an hc1 from hs10 we took our training to go to this new outfit. We were shown movies about what the Army was doing and told us that, you know, we're going into being gunships. And of course, uh, you got to see the movie and uh, they asked for volunteers and we were it. <laughs> we went to Fort Stewart for live fire training. We used the tank ranges. And all the time we were in HC-1. And then we went back to Fort Eustis, Virginia, for maintenance training. We went out to Camp Pendleton for small arms. They brought some of the SEALs over, and they were teaching us hand-to-hand -hand combat. Everything really from that point got rushed because they said, we got to send you now. What we were doing, nobody trained us for. Everything we were doing was on-the-job training. The pilots got flight training from the Army, and we got gunnery training. But when it came into doing certain maneuvers, it, it was just, do it. The thing I'm most proud of was after eight or so months, they had a special operation set up in Cambodia. The river patrol boats were given their choice of all of the air units, whether it's Air Force in Thailand, or the carriers off Yankee Station. At the time, we were called Rawls Rats, and they said, we want those guys. To get these special orders, to me, was about the ultimate compliment. When we formed up, our dead boss, Rocky Rowell, was an aggressive guy. Rock said, we're gonna do it, and we did it. But in contrast, we had Dirty Al, Dirty Al Banford. Al's from New Jersey, sounded like a New Jersey guy. We spent six months together talking about just we were going to take on Charlie, we are going to be the meanest guys. Rowell's Rats, and it, the name seemed to just fit. The Army concluded that they really couldn't operate in the Delta. And the Army pretty quickly realized that the Navy was making headway. So rather than being an inter service rivalry, they were supporting us. Admiral Zumwalt and other naval commanders knew that that was the rice bowl of the Delta. In fact, it was really the rice bowl of all Indochina. They grow tremendous amounts of rice there, and they weren't willing to sacrifice it. So they began to think about establishing units and commands that would allow the Navy to take over the Delta. Rear Admiral Zumwalt was a tactician who quickly realized the importance of the Mekong River and the need to secure its waterways. His plan called for multiple helicopter detachments located throughout the Delta, able to quickly provide decisive firepower. This was going to be a new kind of warfare, and it needed a new kind of helicopter squadron. The Admiral asked for volunteers, and on April 1st, 1967, Helicopter Attack Light Squadron 3, Navy Sea Wolves, part of Task Force 116, was established in the Republic of Vietnam with no fanfare and very few supplies. We were commissioned in Vietnam and decommissioned in Vietnam. And that's never been done before. And it hasn't been done since. We had just returned to the States. I'd gone home to rest for a while, and suddenly I get a phone call from my commanding officer, and he says, you've got command of a squadron. He says, sounds a little bit like Helitic or on three. So I said, uh, Charlie, have you 
been having a little early martini or something like that? He says, no. And so I called the bureau and she says, you've been designated commanding officer of Navy's first helicopter attack squadron. And you have an open checkbook. You're going to be leaving for uh, Fort Worth to visit Bell Aircraft for a few days. You meet your XO, Commander Ron Jayberg, and your ops officer, Commander Ron Hip. There, the three of you proceed to Fort Benning, Georgia for a helicopter gunship training to Camp Pendleton for weapons familiarity with the Marine Corps. We'll report to Saigon and proceed from there to check in with the senior naval officer, President Bung Tao. Khan and Ron and I arrived in Feng Chao, and there were no naval officers there, but the three of us. So we're sitting there deliberating what to do, and the next day, a young Lieutenant J.G. Pistol Boswell showed up. He was a senior naval officer, President Bung Tao. So I looked at him, and I looked at Khan, and I looked at Ron, and I said, gentlemen, let's build a squadron. We were the first to arrive and we had the task of setting up everything. That's different detachments and the different debts, and we had to set up the maintenance facilities to support these aircraft, and not only just for their regular routine maintenance, but any kind of combat damage they would come across. And so when we got there, we didn't have much of anything. Uh, we had a lean-to to work out of, which we called a hangar. We had little shops built, and uh, the Army, at the one end of the hangar had a little sheet metal shop down there. And so anything we needed in the way of material to fix a battle damaged helicopter or anything that we needed to fix, we had to go down and get it from the Army. And then fortunately right across there was a civilian contractor and those guys had some stuff too that even the Army didn't have. Well, <laughs> it was a ragtag operation to begin with. We were Admiral Elmo Zumwalt's trident. SEALs, SEAWOLVES, and PBRs. And then as material and tools and stuff started showing up, then we, our capabilities increased. And we were tasked with a, uh, a workload that was phenomenal because I believe we went on uh, seven days a week, 12-hour days, two shifts, and we did that for a whole year. Once in country, the SEAWOLVES would operate from landing ship tanks, yard repair berths, and Army bases. They would coordinate with river boats, swift boats, and Navy SEALs. Each fire team consisted of two Hueys with eight crewmen. Their aircraft was the UH-1B model Huey, the workhorse of the Vietnam War. Our primary mission was covering all the riverine craft in, in the deltas of Vietnam, tangos and swift boats and PBRs and Yabuda junks and all these other boats. The Army did not do a lot of flying at night to begin with. Their aircraft were not instrumented properly to do a lot of night flying. The Army had to go into a landing zone or into an outpost or whatever, and that put certain restrictions on what they could or couldn't do. We had the advantage that when a river patrol boat called for help, we could put in the strike however we felt was most advantageous for us. We just started out better at because we had more of an instrument scan. The Army invented the gunship tactics, so we have nothing but admiration for them. PBRs were because there weren't roads and everybody traveled on water. And the guys were getting in big trouble. You can't run a Jeep or tank or anything up there. So the close air support was uh, absolutely mandatory. The Navy had been authorized 33 gunships and 11 unarmed helicopters. Rarely, if ever, do we have that many. The Sea Lords was just our unarmed aircraft and the Sea Wolves were the gunships. Sea Lords were UH-1L models. They were larger, they were faster, they were more powerful. We could haul cargo on a hook underneath. The sea Lords flew out of Bentui, our headquarters, and typically every day there would be helicopters going around each detachment, 
bringing equipment, ammunition, supplies, and shuttling people around. They also did inserts and extractions. So if we had a mission to insert seals, typically sea lords do the inserts and extracts, and the sea wolves would cover them with the guns. So it was all one squadron, but we just had the slick aircraft and the uh, gunship. We had the world's best mission. I mean, absolutely the world's best mission. Our job was to be the second cavalry who rides over the hill, and the Indians have the wagon trains are all circled, and the Indians are riding around shooting flaming arrows, and we'd come over the hill with the bugles blowing, and the Indians would leave, and we would we'd save the settlers. Well, that was our job. All these PBRs and swift boats and tango boats and all the different types, we had a thousand boats down there and they were constantly being ambushed. And they were always on the short end of the stick. They were gonna lose the ambush, but we'd get a scramble. We'd usually be in the air in around two minutes. We'd usually be overhead in five and, and save the day because uh, the Viet Cong either had to leave or die. There were different types of scrambles, scramble one, two, or three, depending on who the friendlies were as to what the category it was put in or how intense the contact on the ground was. So scramble one, you're there, you jump the bird and go, you don't have time to think of anything. It didn't matter to us whether it was SEALs or ROKs, Republic of Korea. Those were some bad dudes. They would have a, a button, a horn would go off. Upon scramble, you got up and you ran as fast as you could. And if you were on duty, you got in the bird and away you went. We would go from a dead sleep to full flight in under three minutes. They would just throw in a flight chute real quick and get up on the deck because they'd be warming the chopper up and ready to take off without you. <laughs> you had to get up there in a hurry. You know, our attitude, I, I still have a lighter. It says, live by chance, love by choice, kill by profession. You had to be 100% focused every time. They were loaded to where they would be so heavy where it couldn't fly, but it could lift off if he lightened the weight. So the, the gunners would get out of the helicopter, and the helicopter could lift up and start bouncing down the runway. And when it attained a speed that the gunners couldn't keep up with, they would jump in. And you didn't want to stand there and unload a bunch of ammo or unload a bunch of random fuel. You got people out there in combat, they need you bad. You improvise. And whatever it takes to get you back, that's what we did. We always flew two aircraft, and it was uh, two teams of four. And when you got up there, everybody knew what they were supposed to do, and you covered for each other. We put in about four or five hot rearms. That's where you refuel, rearm, and go back out to your target. After rearming and refueling four or five times, fatigued, tired, not paying as much attention, I almost walked into the tail rotor there of the aircraft as it was turning, sitting on deck. One of the pilots, I remember him telling me, man, you guys, you get cooled up and then we don't need you. He said, hey, we don't pay any attention to scramble numbers. He said, we scrambled to go to a dogfight in Thailand. Oh, obviously, it was an unbelievable adrenaline push. We were adrenaline junkies. They would come constantly, mostly at night, where the boats had gone down, set up an ambush, or the seals had been inserted someplace, and they were now needing us. The nighttime scrambles, taking off into the wild, dark sky. <laughs> Not the wild, blue yonder, but the wild, dark sky. <laughs> I mean, getting scrambled at 2 o'clock in the morning and so dark that you can't even see your hand in front of your face. Then there's some hot stuff. Then your heart starts. Your sense of smell, your sense of touch, your sense of feel. You think that you can look down and see your heart pumping out of your chest. And I've been so frightened that I knew that my heart was beating like a drum and I could see it. Everything is exploded. And then the action starts. Adrenaline takes over, it's all gone. I don't ever
never remember being afraid, been on many SEAL insertions, been on many a gunfight. I don't ever remember being afraid at the time, but I do remember going back to my bunk and laying in my bed and going, oh my God, I am so lucky to be alive. In time of war, there are no awards given for writing or typing up plans, no ceremonies for fixing broken parts, no accolades for the many hours of ingenuity, sweat, and craftiness necessary to ensure everyone gets home safe. Support personnel and maintainers of HAL-3 made up over 50% of the squadron. If you listen closely to the sounds of the Huey's whoop whoop whoop, you can hear the cheers of the gunners, the praise of the pilots, and you can see the smiles, as big as the Mekong Delta, giving them thanks. They made it home safe. One more day. I don't think maintenance is talked about enough. Unfortunately, our maintenance personnel, and there were a bunch of them, they don't get a lot of recognition. I do wish there was some way to make those guys recognize that they are more appreciated than they realize. If it wasn't for maintenance, we would have never kept them aircraft in the air. The helicopters we got were from the Army, and they were beat up pretty good. Hand-me-downs. Yep. We relied on the Army to support all of our logistics for these aircraft because they were basically still Army aircraft. Most of those aircraft had at least 6,000 hours on them. And so when we would get them, it would say uh, United States Army. Well, we would cross out a couple of letters and make it Navy. One time we were flying, and the air crewman started looking over my head as a pilot. And he, there's a pose on the airframe of the plane. He saw it was a crack. And I was so afraid. I said, oh, <laughs> mamita, let's fly slower. That's how I'll tell you how old the planes were. But yet, our guys make miracles with those sent. It was obvious from the beginning to the Army, we weren't going to back down. So they compensated by giving us aircraft that were probably below their standards, but not below our standards, because we had the maintenance personnel and the gunnery personnel, the owners personnel, who were whiz kids. I had to take my skill level and provide the safest possible aircraft for these guys to go up and do their missions in every day. These guys got junk when they come in and made them safe and flyable. My love was just fixing these things. What we could do is take their junk and make it into a limo. And it seemed like the more broke they was, the better I got into it. <laughs> you have to be careful. And you got to pay particular attention to caring for the people that's going to fly in that thing. And you don't take no chances to do your best ability. And if you don't know, you get advice. Because people are going to jump in that thing and they're trusting you. I praised the maintainers. They were magicians and our staff. Because without them, there would have been no mission. We were tasked with a workload that was phenomenal. We were working 12-hour shifts night and day. Seven days a week, thousands and thousands of hours to support what the CVOs were doing over there. We get one shot down or anything, boom, we'd have another one ready for us. We would tear the heck out of some of those things. We smacked in, come in on a hard landing, spread the skids out, tail boom was drooping, put a kink in that middle uh, tail drive shaft, we flip the top up and that thing just wobbling. And it wasn't two weeks, they had it back out on deck. Even if you weren't on duty flying, if there was help needed, they were there. Land, reload, refuel, and they were not rewarded as they should have been. Citations, awards, I mean, those guys were fantastic. They were so important to this squadron, so important. They were the backbone of our squadron. Yeah. first time I went out to the runway, the guy who was training me says, I'm going to show you old Patch. I says, what the hell is old Patch? He says, here it is. 
and you could see all the, where the bullet holes were, and they patched them all up. And you sure this thing's gonna fly? We did eventually get some that had come back from Bell that had been reconditioned yeah. with the higher power engine in them. That was like, oh wow, we got a Cadillac here. <laughs> Well, every time you patched it, you had to cut that spot out and then grind it down and then put the patch on, put zinc chromate on it. And then you had to try and paint over it so it wouldn't corrode, you know? Actually, what they were doing is hiding the name Budweiser. <laughs> yeah, on the, on the patch pad. Back then, we had steel beer cans. You cut a circle out, you epoxy it up, put it back on, sand it down, retrack it, send it on out. Bubble gum, baling wire, and beer cans and contact cement. We used what was available. When I first met Bill Rutledge, the retired senior chief, we flew out to a, a army uh, detachment to pick up a helicopter. And coming back and it was night, and I remember seeing the green traces coming up at us, and Bill Rutledge started firing back because we were receiving a pretty heavy fire during that time. Patching bullet holes, replacing parts that got shot up that were beyond repair. It doesn't sound like much, but that's an extreme amount of time and skill it took to do that because some of the parts you didn't have. Some of the parts you actually have to make. There was a sheet metal shop there that if you could make it, you made it. You don't want to have to wait for parts because we need these birds back in the air. This is a war zone. Parts were not available. There wasn't a warehouse or, or a supply store down the road. We begged, borrowed, stole, and made our own. Sometimes it's different for the way the Army operated or Air Force operated. Navy has been known to make do. Like Pappy Boyington and uh, McHale's Navy, we made these things work. There were a few of us that were fairly adept at finding things kind of like radar and clinger from MASH. There were several other Army hangers in the area, and we would barter with them for this and that and whatever it took to get what we needed. Sometimes they didn't want to barter. We just waited till they left, and uh, we did what in the Navy is called comshaw. <laughs> Comshawing has to do with going and getting something that you need, no matter how bad or how good it is, and, and then by any means you can get it. Not stealing, it was comshaw. We don't talk about that. <laughs> My guys didn't steal the Jeeps. They were in on it. They would steal Jeeps from the Air Force. They had, everybody had a Jeep. We had very few. Seemed like every sergeant in the Air Force in Canto had a Jeep. So we'd go over there and saw it, or bolt cut it off, drive it over to the Navy base it'd been to, it, paint it gray. And after two months, the FBI caught us and came to us and said, this Jeep you've got, it stole from the Air Force and said, damn you, say <laughs> We tried to play safe and everything, and he said, they got the serial numbers and everything, won't know who stole it. And we said, well, I don't know, somebody issued it to us. We lied. And he kept saying, well, this is serious stuff. He was a young guy. So well, what are you gonna do, send us to Vietnam? <laughs> Sometimes it took devious means to keep the things uh, moving as they should have, but Sometimes devious means are the best ways to go about it. The Army's old battle war birds had flown beyond their prime, and everyone knew it. When the opportunity came to use the new Cobra attack helicopter from Bell Aircraft, Captain Spencer declined. The Huey was big and cumbersome, but it was capable of carrying additional personnel perfect for insertions and rescues, which were needed along the Mekong Delta. Gunners would also go through weaponry trial and error. Their greatest strength was that they were willing to leave it all on the line. Many in the Delta called them fearless. Their reputation was second to none. We had three very pleasant days with Bell. Managed to fly the first AH-1, which had just been completed. But at our final meeting with President Bell Aircraft on the third day, I, I had to inform him that even though it was a nice aircraft, it wouldn't suit our missions. And what it boiled down to was basically, we need an aircraft with a cabin. 
We didn't want to be dependent on another service to help us in terms of medevac or rescue. And of course, we had a SEAL mission along with that. Plus the fact that I considered the door gun art to be our secret weapon, mandated that we go to a cabin structured aircraft. You're not turned loose when you immediately get to death. You have to have a trainer. Once we hooked up with somebody to train us, he sat in the middle seat through all the missions. If the mission got too hot, you slid over in the middle seat and the qualified gunner took over. I actually got to be a door gunner. It's scary as hell. It's a pure adrenaline rush. And you don't think, you just act. The story was you had just a few minutes of life left as a gunner. Your life of expectancy was not too long in combat. You're getting fired, you're hearing noises, tracers are coming in, and you say, holy shit, get, get the hell out of here, you know? But you get over it, you say that to yourself, and, and you just get on with your business of surviving, suppressing the fire, and, and saving your buddies. Both gunners could shoot when you're pulling off target and cross vector. And both of you could shoot forward and cross. Now, a mounted gun was just limited. You know, you couldn't do that. So we put free guns, and, and all the recoil would go slide across your arm. You could put it right on, you could write your name and dot the I's and cross the T's, that thing. We flew the minigun, we flew a six barrel minigun, shoot two to four thousand the way we had it set up. They had twin mounted M60s. Earlier, they had 30 cals. We mounted the minigun in the door later, and prior to that, they had miniguns, and they had a flex system with uh, four M60s on the side. We just made up stuff as we went along, like when Fraser did the miniguns. Put the control box in a 50 caliber can, put goop all around it to uh, caulk it up so it wouldn't get wet, and modified a 50 mount, hung that minigun on there, learned how to use it from that. Once that was done, took it down to Ben Tui, and everybody saw what it was done, and they started doing their own door-mounted miniguns. We flew at night in the rain sometimes. It's really dark. You start shooting an M60, and you get the muscle flash, it ruins your night vision, because you can you pick up the river, you can pick up where the firefight's at, and you're shooting, and they're saying, oh, I'll get it in closer, and then all of a sudden, you just can't see anything. So you stop shooting, try to shake it off, and get some idea where they're at again, and start shooting again. More spent. Boy, that guy could shoot at 50 caliber. He shot so close to the seals one time, he put a 50 caliber right through his canteen. When we came back down and land, that seal came in. Morris tried to buy that canteen yeah. off of him. He wouldn't sell it. <laughs> you learn how to repair the M60 in flight. We, they stopped firing. We had to tear them apart in midair and without any lights. You learn to instantly diagnose what was wrong with it. Do it by feel and find out what's wrong and get them to shooting again. People would die if we wouldn't shoot. It's like I remember in training, the guns were mounted and you were sitting behind it and they flew along, black figures, cardboard, and you was like this as you flew on. <laughs> it ain't what it like when you get there. No. Our guns, they weren't mounted. Everything was freehand. We could shoot under the nose, under the tail, under the helicopter. Yeah, you learn to, to do that and learn to keep your gun from jamming yeah. at the same time because you're pulling your ammo out. You carried a box between our legs, 2,000 rounds, and picked it up. And then most of our missions, we expended that and sometimes went back for more. Oh, yeah. yeah. The machine gun, the M60, had uh, clips on it where they, they could put shooting on it. And if we tried to hold them right up, the ammunition would come up and it would jam and would right. catch on that. And some guys got sea ration cans that, that would fit perfectly clipped in there and it would go over and that works somewhat. We could swap a 50 cal out and a minigun out in two or three minutes, ammo and everything. And we could put whatever we wanted, two fifties on the side if you're doing bunkers and two fifties on the other side. We learned what the SEALs would do. We were blooded while we were still in the training seat and typically you were in training for at least a month. In war, necessity is the mother of invention. The Seawolf gunners needed to find a new way of shooting the guns after ruining several tail rotors with bullet shells in the early days. 
we literally laid the M60 receiver on top of our shoulder and we'd reach across the top with our little finger. Our trigger finger was our little finger. Totally unique deal. We had another pistol grip attached on the side. So when it rotated, it was now down, so your left hand would have to hold this pistol grip in front, and we shot like this. We didn't do anything with the intention of being outstanding or standouts or anything of that nature. It just evolved into that because our mission was to cover the guys on the ground. When it's dark, you can't see anything, and it's raining like mad. You get out to the contact zone, and you know who is who by the color of the tracers going back and forth. Whatever tactic it took to get the guys on the ground out of there, that's what we tried to do. But we used to shoot the darn thing so much that it would ruin the barrel. But we always had six barrels on the back of the co-pilot seat. We had a little rack made up with little pieces of pipe about that high, and you could stick that barrel down in there, and it would hold the barrels in place. So when you got a barrel that was too hot to use, dump the thing out, put another one in, and keep going. A lot of the guys will tell you about getting those things cherry red and white hot. It's no lie. You could actually see the bullets going through the barrel out the tip of the barrel. You could shoot five, six, seven thousand rounds on a mission. There was no safe seat. All four seats in that helicopter were death seats. No one spared. Pilots got killed and gunners got killed. There was no safe place in Vietnam. There was no back lines to get behind to be safe. The most important factor for us coming home with minimum damage was the gunners because we were vulnerable totally to the flank and to the rear. These guys had these crucial decisions to make. How you find the enemy? Send a boat down the river and they shoot at you, there's the enemy. Here's the sea wolves. That's how I saw them, I mean, these heroes. It's nice that they feel as they do about the pilots, but we feel most grateful of any part of the operation for the job that our door guns did. In the first year, the Sea Wolves would log 16,000 flight hours and 11,000 combat missions. After the maintainers work their magic, the pilots would now have to use their superb instrument training. Overloaded with ammo and fuel, they quickly earned a stellar reputation for their flying skills, their ability to navigate in pitch black darkness, heavy monsoon rains, and at treetop level. They never turned a mission down. Our pilots and co-pilots, they were gods. They could put us in and out of places and do things that any civilian pilot would probably mess their britches. Watching the Army, I could see that the fire teams were expendable. You see a lot of helicopters, crews going down in the Army. I figured the Navy might be the same. But once I got to HAL 3, I saw the professionalism of our pilots. These guys were trained to land on a carrier deck in the dark in pitching waters in the rain. They had the best experience, best training. When we were absorbed into HAL 3, I had been a co-pilot, and all of a sudden, I was now a pilot. Not just a pilot, I was a fire team lead. Well, was, we were kind of a unique group. We all got thrown together into a detachment, and we showed up as pilots, as absolute rookies, had no combat experience, obviously, very little flight time. Our maintenance people and our door gunners were in about the same boat. And so we kind of worked together as a team. We developed our own tactics, figure out the best way to accomplish our mission with the least amount of danger. There was no officer enlisted separation. Nope. The crew and the pilots were one group. Yep. We had a real good relationship with all our officers and we counted on them and they counted on us. It was hard to tell one mission from another, especially if you're flying at night or in the rain. We would take off sometimes. We couldn't see the end of the little runway we were at, which the little runway was maybe 100 feet long. Doing the Cambodian incursion, them sea wolves, man, they were just all day long, all night long, just scramble, scramble, scramble. I remember one day they made 12 hot reloads. 
And this started at like noon and went to well after midnight. You know, they would fly for an hour or so and they'd come back and we were shoving new rockets, getting fuel. And I never will forget, they just barely got it. Woo, 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 woo. And just, they pulled it up right off the ground and they dumped it. And it actually would go down about two or three feet off the water and just slowly climb. And we'd watch the taillights go off into the night like with the stars. We saw these guys as like the cavalry. If something goes wrong, they're gonna come in, they're gonna save us. But they probably deterred more from ever happening by just being there. And they would fly in low. They fly so low, the shells were raining down on the boat. <laughs> we had some great pilots, calm, collective, under pressure, they knew what to do. We actually were just passengers. We went along <laughs> with it. <laughs> and it was, uh, well, the thing of it is, okay. and they protected us, the pilots did, and we protected them. We would bring the seals in, we would bring the seals out, we would cover the seals when they were on the ground. We were there for them. We loved them. It depending on what we would do with an operation, we didn't like going out if they weren't up and running or they had other commitments. So when they weren't available, our op might change because if something went south, they were the guys that were gonna have to come take care of us to get us out. They had no qualms about doing that. These guys were fearless. We did have one particular operation where we mistakenly landed in the middle of a VC company and we were surrounded. We inserted into a village because we knew there were a lot of VC there. We started leapfrogging into the village. We had probably gotten maybe 100 yards, 200 yards and took all kinds of heavy fire. The sea wolves were a number of clicks off circling. We scrambled the sea wolves to help us. And here comes the sea wolf. Probably 20, 25 feet off the deck, and the miniguns were just smoking. Pounding away at the VC positions, it was a sight to see. Two o'clock in the morning, our fire team was scrambled. Within three minutes, we were airborne, and we were heading out in support for a SEAL team in heavy contact. So we arrived on station, door guns quickly engaged, then initiated rocket runs on the enemy forces, kept our support up until fuel for at least one ship needed to be replenished. So lead ship went back to seafloat, solid anchor, and refuel, we rearmed, and this was a typical strategy that if you had a group in contact, you would alternate helicopters of refuel and rearm. That way you always had guns over the boat at all times. So we and lead get a radio contact from Seafloat that the fuel dump had broke down. You make the call, and of course you make the call not just based on your crew in the airplane or the trail ship, but you're making the call for the guys on the ground too. I think it kind of became an unwritten mantra of that we never leave people behind. I felt the need to at least discuss within my cockpit why we were doing it. And not that, what do you think? It was why we were doing it. They all said, amen. They were 100% not saying it, but almost like, you don't even have to say that. We know what you're doing and we're with you. The trail ship could not refuel, which meant that neither could we if we went back. Nobody could refuel. And we still had seals in heavy contact. So, you know, our option obviously was, if you're out of fuel, you gotta go somewhere to land. If we ran out of fuel and had not been relieved, we were gonna land with the seals. So we stayed on station, uh, low fuel light comes on, and anybody that's ever seen a low fuel light in an aircraft 
But it's a, it's a focused deal. You know it's on. It's very bright. The interesting thing is it keeps getting brighter. It seems to anyway. And it became to the point where we didn't have enough fuel even to get back to where the fuel was. So, I mean, we were, were obviously committed to stay. Not too much before we would have flamed out, DET-6 and DET-3 arrived. So we stayed on station just long enough for those two detachments to get a foot on what was happening. And they fueled up, flew to us, where we drained fuel out of their helicopter into ammo cans. And we refueled our helicopter enough so we could get back to, to solid anchor sea flow. It was just a typical day from there on. We did our maintenance, we fixed our guns, and prepared for the next flight. It's just the way it was. By 1972, the Sea Wolves and Navy SEALs would develop a special bond, a bond that has stood the test of time and still exists today. Due to the uniqueness of the Sea Wolf Squadron, most Americans didn't know or believe that such a squadron even existed. Such was the case with Don Morgan, who would share stories of his combat missions at his local VFW, but was oftentimes made to feel like he was telling tales. That would all change when Navy SEAL Medal of Honor recipient and guest speaker Michael Thornton visited. I waited till the crowd thinned out a little bit and I walked over and I just looked at him and went, damn, Mike, <laughs> you let yourself go to hell. And it's like the look on his face was priceless. And he goes, well, who were you with? And I said, you probably never know my, who my squadron was. I mean, nobody knows us and nobody believes we existed. And he looked up at me eyeball to eyeball and said, you're a freaking sea wolf. And I went, how about that? Of course, we did the brother hug. And it was about 10 minutes. We were, we were arm in arm and ear to ear. And uh, lots of tears flowed. And when we finally let go of each other, guys standing around looked at me entirely different than they had looked at me before. They thought I was BSing them all the time. Oh, we don't have never heard that squadron. So yeah, okay, Congressional Medal of Honor tells you that, yeah, he's a sea wolf and he's crazy. When a SEAL tells you you're crazy, and we already know they are, that's one of the highest compliments that uh, we could probably be given. big Tet Offensive in 1968 where the North Vietnamese decided they were going to take over the whole country. And so they attacked every major base there was in South Vietnam all on the same day. On January 28, 1968, forces on both sides called a ceasefire in observance of the Vietnamese New Year, known as Tet. For the South Vietnamese Army, it was a time to stand down, with nearly 50% of the forces on leave for the holiday. For the Sea Wolves, it was business as usual, patrolling the waterways, looking for enemy movements. Within the first few hours, the Sea Wolves had seen enough enemy activity in the Delta to suspect that the ceasefire would not last. Their observations would prove correct. At midnight on January 30th, the North Vietnamese Army would unleash hell, an all-out attack. The Sea Wolves immediately go into action. They attack a group of sampans, and what would become known as the Tet Offensive was now on. The enemy had caught everyone by surprise, almost. They failed to realize there were Sea Wolf bases off the LSTs and YRBMs. During Tet, the Sea Wolves would fly 24 hours a day. During the Tet 68, the Viet Cong were very smart and they hit Tan Snoot and all the major bases. The Sea Wolves kicked butt in Tet. They were flying 24 hour shifts just constantly. They made their lives hell. They hurt them badly. The entire river patrol force basically did. The North Vietnamese had said, We'll be right behind you. You lead the charge and we'll be right behind you. Well, they watched the Viet Cong being slaughtered and said, Well, maybe we won't be right behind you. So from that point on, the Viet Cong was a different entity because they had mostly been slaughtered. 
So from that point on, most Viet Cong units were manned at least 60% by North Vietnamese. On shore patrol, you got to carry a 45, and during Tet, we got carried an M16. So I volunteered for shore patrol quite a bit, and I actually, I paid a guy $5 to stand his watch. So I could, for like six hours a night, I could feel safe from six to midnight, because that was the only time we was allowed to have the guns. Then Long got overrun. Our guys, they were afraid after the overrun of the base, they had to truck them out of there, and uh, we flew cover for them along with another detachment. There was four of us gunships over. Those guys followed them all the way back to the base. It was an arduous situation. With the Viet Cong having growing concerns that the South Vietnamese were working with the U.S. forces, there were two ways the VC would deal with it. They had to eliminate them, and to do that, they have to either they recruit those people uh, working on base, or they kill them, kill the family. Over 80,000 North Vietnamese forces in Viet Cong attacked over 100 towns, cities, and military bases throughout Vietnam. One of the most intense attacks took place at Vinh Long Airfield, a major army airfield and naval base for PBRs, located in the heart of the Mekong Delta. North Vietnamese forces infiltrated the center of the base through drainage ditches and resorted to hand-to-hand -hand combat along the way. They started knifing a lot of us. We have a lot of wounded, and out of the knifing, a lot of U.S. personnel were killed. We spent time fighting like an infantry uh, man instead of pilots uh, and air crew, and it was fighting for our own survival. Attacks on Vinh Long would last for more than a month. Sleep deprivation and lack of food, ammunition and supplies would all become risk factors. Thousands of Vietnamese citizens could be seen fleeing the city in search of safety. Charlie held the north end of the base, close to the Catholic-run orphanage, which would also come under attack. The Sea Wolves, along with the Seabees, Seals, PBRs, and all Brown Water Navy forces would help feed, clothe, and provide water and medical care for orphans. These efforts would be even more critical during the Tet Offensive. They comshawed three generators for the orphanage to provide electricity. It was a great humanitarian effort. The three Van Loan was supporting this orphanage outside the base. Orphanage run by Catholic nuns running this orphanage of uh, kids from infants all the way to 12, 13 years or so. We had one fellow that volunteered, Chuck Fields. He's no longer with us, unfortunately. Mr. Bouchard. And Chief Bouchard. And they went over there into that orphanage and shuttled also took out the 50. Yeah, and took out the 50. <laughs> Three Seawolves, Chuck Fields, Joseph Bouchard, and Francis Smith would volunteer to defend the orphanage by keeping watch on the rooftop, armed with an arsenal of ammunition and weapons. The Army, able to get two Hueys, would head toward the Vinlong base where the Seawolves would help fuel and rearm the planes and start the evacuation of the orphanage. With the entire airfield surrounded, it would be the Sea Wolves and Army working together to rescue the 130 orphans and 12 nuns. They actually set them up on the tennis court in tents, and that was kind of their bivouac for all the, the nuns and the orphans. They were still receiving a lot of fire from the building, and we went in there and had to rocket it. They hit us pretty hard. They actually had sappers that got onto the base. Oh, yeah. yeah and they took out a lot of helos. I seem to remember seeing about 50 body bags. They just had them stacked like cordwood. We were able to kill all of them. To our surprise, uh, some of the people killed with the braces of the uh, Viet Con were our barber mates. We realized that right in there that we were in a war that by pressure, by intimidation, everybody will participate in against us. I figure that this is gonna be a losing battle. 
because of the eradicate uh, the communists believe that if you are a warm body, you can carry a rifle. Although Tet was a tactical disaster for the enemy, there were major casualties on both sides. The Viet Cong had suffered such extreme losses, Tet was viewed as a losing battle. American forces also began to view the war differently. Witnessing the horrors of casualties would begin to take its toll. Public perception of the war would reach a turning point with Tet. Americans stateside became more aware of the horrors of war due to extensive media coverage of the Tet Offensive, overlooking the sacrifices our military were making to stop the spread of communism. The U.S. military, like the men of the HAL-3 Seawolves, would feel the brunt of American protests for years to come. On March 16, 1972, the Seawolves would be disestablished under Captain Mulcahy, the last commanding officer of HAL-3. The squadron would never officially spend a day in the United States, and the men's welcome home was not what they expected. White House congressional recognition wouldn't come until 2010, almost 40 years later. You know, every other outfit, Army and Air Force, they always they have a home back here in the States somewhere, and we don't. There's no, you know, no signs up there, this is home of Hell 3 or something like that, because we don't have any home. Public was pretty much saturated by the media that we were outlaws, we were baby killers, we were whatever bad guy they could name it. Very, very harsh. I would uh, brag about coming back from Vietnam and says, yeah, so what? Even today, someone will say, what did you do? I was a door gunner in the Navy. Uh, phooey, the Navy didn't have something like that. Well, uh, I'm sorry, but you can be corrected, sir. And it's called baby killer. And I never killed anybody except those that try to kill me. I was told not to wear my uniform home. I was told uh, to put on civilian clothes. When I came home from Vietnam and, and on leave, they had to shuttle us out the back. We had choices, either put your civilian clothes on or we're gonna shuttle you around the back. Cause out front were protesters throwing bags of crap and stuff at you. After I got home, like I say, the treatment was a, was a little different. They didn't want you around. The most frustrating thing was when we came home and, and we told people we were Navy and they said, oh yeah, we saw your ships off the coast. And I said, no, I was up in Cambodia. <laughs> Nobody even had a clue the Navy was even in the war you know what i mean it, it was like a mystery or something everybody knew about the marines everybody knew about the army but when they said navy they didn't have a clue we did not have battles like the alamo it was uh, small firefights two boats and 25 guys and sea wolves coming in to help us we felt sad because we couldn't explain our brag on our medals and stuff to america because at that point in time uh, half the country was mad about soldiers and sailors and stuff. And I don't know what happened to all those uh, draft card burning, uh, free love, uh, drug culture hippies. I guess they morphed into people that look like us. I mentioned at the beginning that uh, I felt like if we were forgotten when, when we were sent to Van Lund, well, I don't want the history to to go down the drain. I want the history to, to continue. But it was disappointing when Walter Cronkite, Uncle Walter, decided that there was no way that we could win, and that was after Tet, 68. They had just stomped Charlie's ass, and we were in control of most everything. But when Uncle Walter came back and said, can't do it, then the protest stateside really got crazy. And the next few years, we were all baby killers and, you know, mongrels of all sorts. It will be a moment in our life that very few of us will every year pass. <laughs> and um, all the memories will go away with them or with us. That's why I kind of just forgot it all and closed up what was behind me. Do you remember the end of Rambo 2? Okay, 
it's in every Rambo movie that he made, he always had the opportunity to say something profound at the end of the movie. At the end of Rambo 2, when he got back with the POWs and shot up the little CIA headquarters in the hangar, and Colonel Troutman, was his name, asked him, he said, Johnny, what do you want? He said, I want what they want, what we all want, just once. We'd like our country to love us as much as we love her. That's what I'd like to share. Don was under the crash helo. We couldn't get him out. That was hard. It sticks in my mind. It's memorable, but it's not. It's hard. We saw the bird go down. So you start suppressing fire, and you go to the helo, because that's going to be your cover while you're there. And unfortunately, the crew chief on the left side of the downed helo was under the helo. And only part of his arm was sticking out. And it appeared like he was clawing at the side of a ship to get out. But he couldn't, and we couldn't lift the helo off him. And at the same time, we're still taking fire. So we were told to get on board our, our ship, back on our ship, and take the remaining people with us. And one of the officers who held Don's hand wouldn't leave, you know, leave Don behind, and was told to get on the ship that Don was already dead and had been dead for a while. It was just muscle spasms. And we left. I found out that a, a ship had, had come along later and picked up the helo off and recovered him. And it bothers me to this day. You know, PTSD counselors and such, you know, they talk about survivor's guilt. That's one classic example of survivor's guilt. I realized I never had cried. I wanted to cry. I wanted it because it was like a knot inside of me. And that didn't happen actually until the year 2000 when I went to Angel Fire and I walked into the chapel there and I was sitting and thinking about those guys. And uh, I heard a voice obviously in my head, but uh, it said, let go. And I started to bawl and I was, I was ecstatic that I was crying and tears were running down my, but I was also thought at the same time, uh-oh, I can't turn this off. This is how I'm gonna be from now on. And uh, that was my first release, uh, my first emotional outburst that I recall. We come down, guns are blazing. We land down, I see the green smoke. I jump out, I run over, and uh, there's, there's some seals standing over a few dead bodies. There's one guy wounded. They were saying, take him. So I grabbed him, put him over my shoulder. His whole side of his face was shot off and he was bleeding all over. So he wasn't giving me much resistance. I put him on my shoulder. I ran back to the, to the helicopter. I dropped him in, boom, they take off. And uh, that was my first mission. Part of my PTSD is startle effect. And when we were working off the LSTs, the bell would ring and say, scramble the sea wolves. And the, the sound, I still hear the sound as part of my startle effect. 
We were in the air in two minutes shooting. They brought a litter, two stretcher bearers, and there's a little girl on there. And on the near side was a Vietnamese soldier, which was obviously the father. And on the other side of the stretcher was obviously the mother, and somebody handed me her IV bottle. So I've got this IV bottle, and this dad picks up his daughter. And our eyes met briefly. Not a word was spoken, but I knew what he was saying. He says, this is my little girl, and I'm trusting you to save her. And I just kind of shook my head, and you expect casualties in battle. You expect adults. The Navy didn't tell me about little kids. And I was mad at the Navy for making me do this, and I didn't know what to do. And the only thing I could do is I, I reached around with these two fingers, and I reached around this thing, and I found a saucer. And I pushed my fingers to plug up the, this wound. I don't, I don't know if that was the right thing to do. I, I, I didn't have the, I don't know what to do, so I just stuck my fingers into her chest. And we land, pull into the room at Vetman. He comes up to me right away, and he's doing his thing. He says, sorry, Madrid, it's too late for this one. And he goes around the other end of the helicopter to take care of the other one. And I go, no, doc, you're wrong. She, she just passed out. She's going to be all right. We're here at the hospitals down the road. She's going she's to be all right. And they start hauling the wounded out. And I set her on the litter. And on the side of the litter, there's a little ring where you can pull a rod out. And it goes up, and it has a little crook on it. And I set that in there, and I hang the IV bottle. Somebody reached up and took this bottle off and stuck it under her arm. And then it finally hit me that she hadn't survived. She was dead. And I wanted to fall down right there and cry because I promised to save her. And I couldn't. And like I said, I wanted to fall down and cry. But I couldn't. I didn't have the time for that luxury because this isn't over with. The bird's still turning. The pilots are in there. We've got to take off, go back to the long strip. We've got to refuel, we got to rearm the rockets, we got to come back, get the bird ready, because we could get scrambled again. I had to come back out, and I never cried. Didn't, didn't have that luxury. And it was years later, probably close to 10 years later. I was working swing shift, and I took a break, and I flipped on PBS or something, and they were doing a documentary on cancer cases, and there was a little girl in there and had leukemia, and they went to take a blood sample, and she cried. And something set this off, and it all came back. And I caught up for years, and I cried till I was dry and till I got sick. couldn't save her and she still haunts me to this day. It's not like, it's gonna sound crazy, but sometimes she'll come to me in my dreams and she'll speak to me in English and she'll say, it's all right. It's all right, she says, my mother and father don't blame you. And I'm in a happy place. And then she'll name off people that I've lost, like my sister or I remember when Captain Twight died, she said, Captain Twight's here, and I'm happy, and they're all happy. And if you want to be happy, too, you can come with me anytime. The conscious mind, the part that's talking to you now, says, maybe a modern-day trauma team with all the equipment, with all the training, could have saved her, but you couldn't. You're not to blame that part of me, but there's still a part of me down in style that still feels guilty because I wasn't good enough. Just couldn't save them all. But... I 
everybody's one big family, you might say, because everybody realizes what everybody else did. It wasn't a, a one man did this. It took a group effort. Thank you for this opportunity, and I'm grateful to the Seawolves for the contribution they made to the ministry and uh, how inspiring they were and how patriotic they were and how sacrificial they were. When you went out on detachment, you bonded with your pilots, your fellow gunners. Even to this day, you hold them a much higher accord than anybody else that you ever come in contact with in the service. It's a camaraderie you really can't explain, you just have to accept. I think the uniqueness part of it was the fact that we were over there with very, very little training. Learn as we went. We basically developed our own tactics. I always said I had more responsibility than I had the rest of my 21-year naval career as a squadron CO, an air boss on a ship, everything else. I still had more responsibilities of lieutenant junior grade, which today is absolutely out of the question. And I always compared ourselves to Pappy Boynton's black sheep in World War II. I always felt like we were the, the renegades of the, of the U.S. Navy and no one knew how to handle us and no one knew any more than we did and didn't know what to do with us. So they just said, go do it, and we did it. And if you've been in combat, you are closer than family. And there's no getting out of that. And I don't care if you knew the Sea Wolf or not, he's a Sea Wolf, he was there, he did the same thing. Our maintenance guys were there and they came out to deaths and put their lives at risk to fix the aircraft out there when you're under mortar rocket attack and getting shot up and going out to and from. And only that person can tell you in his heart how he feels about another. And I'm telling you, my personal thing is, I love my family. I love my mom, dad, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. But there's nothing like love of a sea wolf. We didn't function as a, as a a group of people, we function as one person, we thought as one person, we fought as one person. And it didn't matter whether you were a cook or whether you were a steward or whether you were a, a yeoman or whatever you might be. If the need was there, that's the job you did. And we overlapped in just about every phase. So there was a lot of, there was a big common denominator there. There was a lot of pride there. and. Uh, our appearance was kind of unique, too, because we flew in what we could find to fly in. We couldn't get flight suits because the Navy said that it wasn't uh, authorized for our area. So, you know, we just flew with standard Army issue equipment and flight gear and what's, what uniforms we could find. It was a very strong, strong bonded brotherhood. When you go in and, and somebody's taking fire and they're screaming for help and you scramble and you roll in, later bringing over some beer and dropping it at your hoots, saying you guys saved us yesterday. We really appreciate it. It just was a, it was almost inexplainable how the, the pride, I mean, look at it, it's still going all these years later. Ross Perot and uh, Senior and, and his son, uh, this the barbecue, the spread that they put on, not just the spread, going out there with the police motorcade, stopping traffic on the on the freeway, and then uh, the food to get choked up just because, uh, you know, what it what it meant to all of us. It, the fact that you know we did it for the whole unit was just my hats off to them, salute them. When you've been in combat with some guys, there are things, trust issues, and other things that you bond with that uh, they last forever convoying us out seven bus loads and they were stopping traffic and all that we got the greatest kick out of that on the bus i was on last night at the circle t the barbecue that ross Perot jr put on for us was probably the single best welcome home appreciation and the police escort out and back was just over and above anything that we could have possibly imagined. When they played God Bless the USA by Lee Greenwood, the band started it and the rest of us finished it. And we were holding hands and our hands were up high and you could feel the electricity going through. You could feel the intensity. You could feel the emotion. 
We never got our welcome home 40 odd years ago. We got it last night. Like a family, and there was military etiquette, but it was very, very loose. We were all getting shot at every day together, you know, and <laughs> that makes you form a bond pretty good. The people we work with are brothers. They're blood brothers, every one of them. There is no stronger relationship, not even within a family, as we have within our Sea Wolf Brotherhood. We would never leave one behind. This squadron stood up in Vietnam and stood down in Vietnam, so there's not a lot of visibility uh, in today's world for uh, what we did. I'd just like to see uh, uh, those of us that, that, that were in this uh, event to be able to stand tall. I am no warmonger, and we all hated that war. We all lost friends, and none of us came home the same. No young man goes to war and comes home the same. But I was the guest speaker at the Sea Wolf Convention in Nashville, and I got up and I let every mother, daughter, sister there know that their fathers were heroes to us. And because of them, more of us survived. They were the heroes of my youth and have remained there my entire life. I have more friends in HAL 3 than I do at home. I don't know what it is. years, we're still friends. The end of the Sea Wolves would mark the end of an unprecedented chapter in naval aviation history. Without fanfare, without uniform, without a welcome home, the Sea Wolves were lost to history. Though their legacy lives on in the tactical playbook of their successors, the HSC-84 Red Wolves and the HSC-85 Firehawks, the true stories of their courage, service, dedication, and brotherhood have been untold until now. Commanding Officer Robert Spencer said it best. We began as an unknown and unproven quantity with a little known nickname, Sea Wolves. Together, we have built a squadron and the word Sea Wolves has become synonymous with the term can do. And Charlie knows well the feeling of a wolf's teeth, HAL 3 has established and perfected a new means of naval warfare. Located in Southern California, Pacifica Christian High School has done something unique. They've taken on the name of the HAL 3 Sea Wolves. Each year at the homecoming game, the Sea Wolves are honored during a halftime ceremony. The school hosts a Sea Wolf luncheon, where the men give a presentation that includes a history of their squadron and what they did during the Vietnam War. For the Sea Wolves, it's an amazing day to be able to share with students, knowing their name and their legacy will live on forever. And I think it's a great honor the way these people are acknowledging our service. Uh, when I got out of the military, it was quite a different thing, the way, the way people felt about us. And it really feels great for them to feel the way they do nowadays. Extremely honored. And um, it's a profound moment when this far along in my life, we're invited into a high school such as Pacifica Christian and realize that they have adopted our squadron and its history and its culture um, to form new leaders.
Boy, oh boy. What an, what an achievement, Jeff and Shannon. I mean, you took us, that is such a journey that you took us on. Um, I, you know, I'm, I was writing notes there the whole time and, um, I just kept on writing the footage and the veterans, the footage and the veterans. I mean, that you, you captured such gold platinum in the stories. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to start. I, I'm reading some of the comments here in the chat too. It's um, this film is a 360 degree look at one year of service in Vietnam for these, you know, for, for the, those who served in that with the sea wolves. And what I love about it is that, you know, the focus is, is, is not just on the action, not just on the blood and guts, you know, it's the, the care that you took with kind of telling the stories of the maintainers, you know, that the care that you took to talk about the bonds that they had with each other, that the, you, you, you know, when you were, uh, when they were, when the veterans were describing what a day or a week was like, you kind of felt exhausted, <laughs> you know, this is a 24 hour, seven day a week job for one year, just stunning achievement, Jeff and Shannon. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this hey, film so is golden. Yeah. Truly was quite an honor. <laughs> you know, one of the things I will say is when, after we premiered the, the movie. Easiest place on earth. But there's another hot spot in Canaheim. Oh, Blocks yeah. me from the park. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, yeah, after we premiered the movie, the next day Shannon's dad was going to become the president of the Sea Wolf Association. And so we had stayed at, for, at the reunion. And that night there was a gentleman that was sitting in the lobby. And everybody was coming up to us talking about the movie. And he waited till the very end after everybody left. And he waited about an hour. And I told Shannon, oh, no, I have a feeling this guy's going to have a complaint because he's been waiting for an hour right. to talk to us. So then he yeah. said, can I talk to you for a minute? So we sat down with him <clears throat> and he said, uh, I just want to tell you guys, I've never seen a documentary that for everything that you talked about, you had a piece of video or a picture for it. It blew me away what you guys had. And I'm not coming to you because I am i don't know what I'm talking about. I, I teach film at a university and I believe it was in Texas. And I'm just so impressed with what you did that I had to wait and tell you. So we were thanking him and we talked for a little bit and then he left. And so Shannon and I right away looked him up. <laughs> who, who, who is this guy? Does he have any credentials? And then we find out that he was a, you know, several time Emmy winner for documentaries and uh, was on a team with for Academy Awards. And so we were, we felt really good. And of course, our biggest thing was to get a positive reaction from the Seawolves because nobody had seen the film and we were worried well what if they don't like it <laughs> and and we were on the midway and we thought well they'll throw us overboard or... yeah right <laughs> right easy easy solution right push yeah. you overboard right really bad <laughs> so we were we were worried but i was just telling shannon i had uh one of my friends from high school was there and i just remember we had, I had come up on the stage to talk at the very end and when it ended, it was dead silent. I thought, oh, my God, they didn't like it. Yeah. And then about 15 seconds went by, and then they all stood up and gave us a standing ovation. Gosh. And so, and there was 1,100 people at the screen. I'm so getting chills. Yeah. It was, it was absolutely, like, electric. And I just remember thinking, like, wow. And I remember my friend approaching me, and she just had <laughs> mascara all over yeah. her eyes. And she was still crying, and she said, Oh my gosh, I didn't know that it was going to be this. I didn't know that you were going to touch on that human emotion element. And That's it, it. Was all emotion. And then I started looking around at the rest of the people and I could see the emotion that it had on a lot of the uh, veterans and, and the audience that was there. So, 
Yeah, and I I didn't cry. This is I have allergies. That's that's my explanation. That's why my eyes are are red and swollen here. Uh, I do want to open it up for a conversation and for questions. We have some sea wolves <laughs> here with us in the room. If you have a question or if you have a comment about the film, feel free to raise your hand. You could you could wave your hand like this in front of the camera, and I will try and catch you. Or you could raise the zoom hand, and that'll put you right up in the in my sights here and I'll be able to see that you have something to say. Uh, but I, I do know that we have a few sea wolves. We have uh, Dick Barr, we have Barry. Barry, what was your experience of seeing this for the first time? Well, I was, I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure I have the proper words for it. It's just unbelievable, I guess, unbelievable. It's, it, it, it was so, it told everything. I mean, I, I just, couldn't believe it. It was just phenomenal uh, hearing from all parts of the uh, unit itself, you know, maintainers, pilots, gunners, and others, and, and hearing some input from people we supported. That was pretty cool, too. So you know, Very, rarely do you get to hear from the people you support. That's right. And, and the other thing is, the, what I was thinking when I jotted down is, I'm wondering if you guys, the Sea Wolves themselves, had ever seen that footage before. I mean, the footage was harrowing. I felt like I was in that helicopter on some, you know, some of those intense times. Hmm. Was that footage you had ever seen before? I had seen some of it. Actually, a lot of us had bought Super 8 movie cameras. And when we had the opportunity, we would shoot film. So I had seen some of the footage because a lot of it, well, I, let's just say I've seen a lot of the footage. You've but seen a lot of the footage. There's plenty I hadn't seen, especially the inter individual interviews. Uh, <laughs> didn't see any of that. And that was pretty awesome. And, and Barry, it's just the eloquence of our veterans. I mean, we've been, you know, Veterans Breakfast, we've been doing this 15 years. We've had thousands of veterans share stories. Veterans' eloquence about their service never it never ends uh never ceases to impress me i mean i'm just the people who gave told their stories in the film wow was that wonderful rick what what was your job with the sea wolves uh i was on uh when i got there in 71 i was started at the line crew and then started flying in uh, sea lords and and that's I, I hold the distinction, my claim to fame. I was the la I was on the crew of the last flight of HAL 3. Myself, the CO, the XO, and another crewman. Uh, the CO, of course, was Commander Mulcahy. Right. And, and uh, that's, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> I was the last flight. You were the last flight. And, and did, did that ring true, that, that sense that we heard at the end of the film where the veterans, you know, you guys come home and like nobody's ever heard of you. Nobody believes you. That did happen, huh? Pretty much. Uh, uh, I remember landing at uh, Travis and I was in, wore my civilian clothes, took a bus down to SFO and then flew down to Los Angeles to visit my parents. And how do you even begin to talk to your parents or other family members or old friends or neighbors about your service, about that one year in Vietnam? My dad was World War II veteran uh, in the Battle of Leahy Gulf on his Jeep carrier, huh. the Sangamon. Wow. And we always had that connection. We were both served in the Navy during a war. Actually, I'm third generation. My grandfather was also on a minesweeper during World War I. Uh, that I never knew him. Uh, but at any rate, dad and I could chat a little bit more. And I've talked to my mother, who's sleeping over here, uh, and, and told her stories that dad told me. And mom's gone, he never told me that. <laughs> we just we never talk about pretty much what we experienced over there, you know, whether, you know, for me in Vietnam or dad during World War Two. You know, uh, and I'll just say this as an aside, Rick, last week we had 99 year old Bob Miller 
on our program. He was on the Sangamon for the Battle really? of Lake Golf. Yes. Yes. Really? Yeah. It, really, really mm-hmm. fascinating. I see Jim Pujala is with us. He wasn't a Sea Wolf. He was an Army helicopter pilot in Vietnam. Uh, Jim, if you want to unmute, did you know about the Sea Wolves? Did you know this whole story? I, <clears throat> I did not know the story, but uh, it, it sounds like the Sea Wolves inherited some of the B model Huey gunships that I flew. And I can attest that they were lousy helicopters <laughs> that were tough to maintain. And I give the maintenance folks for the Sea Wolves all the credit in the world for keeping those things in the air. And I, I wrote down, Jeff and Shannon, I so admire you for taking the time to really focus on the maintenance of these machines, because, you know, the, the temptation, if you want to, you know, audio Hollywood kind of version is you want to focus on the action, the pilots and all that. But so none of that would have been possible without that extraordinary heroic effort, uh, you know, patching those things back up so they could be, they could fly again. Mark Spear Digliozzi. I just, uh, an observation with Shannon and Jeff that it gave me, I, I flew in, in the UEs also with the 1st Cavalry Division in I Corps. And one of the things that this brought to light to me, I was a passenger. Um, this brought a brand new perspective to me as to what went into, number one, keeping those things up yeah. in the air, number yeah. one. And number two, the, the danger that, that they that they fought, they fought every day the same as we did, uh, and and the surprise that the Navy actually um, had this had these sea wolves there was just amazing. And and Jeff, I, I I thank Jeff and Shannon both. I thank you guys for bringing in some points to light that this old guy never saw. Isn't that great from a, from an infantryman, Pat Sam Pat Samuel? How are you? I'm doing fine. One thing. When we saw the premiere on the flight deck of the Midway, what really hit home for me was the way Jeff and Shannon presented the maintainers. Yeah. They have, there is no, no words to express how grateful the air crew is for their maintenance abilities. The other, only other thing that got to me was the, a story Mike Madrid put out about the little girl. Oh my gosh. And Mike is with us yes, here he I see in the Zoom room. Yeah. Mike, that story is so heartbreaking. Yeah, I lived with that for a long time. One of the things I, I don't think Jeff and Shannon realize is before they started this project, we would go to a reunion and everybody's fine. Everybody's doing great. Nobody has a problem. Right. And it wasn't until they started interviewing that I got blown away when Bill Rutledge said he was scared and, and Terry Parrington couldn't cry. And now we can talk about that. And the other thing is, is you come home and you try and tell the only people to listen to you is your folks. And they didn't get it till they saw the movie. And if you want to follow up on my story. I, got, I was still haunted for a long time. And then February 28th of 2020, I went back to Vietnam. I went back on my uh, 72nd birthday. And Vietnam is completely changed. The only thing that is, isn't unchanged is the heat and the humidity. And I was staying with a family and they had a little girl who was the same age, same weight, because I could pick her up and swing her around. And she's got a big brother and she's got a mother and a father. And uh, they all live in like a a family compound. She's got aunts, uncles, grandparents, goes to a Montessori school, well-fed, happy. She's my best buddy when I'm there. And not just her, uh, the kids are happy there. It's such a change. And I've been there about, 10 days and I woke up one morning and you know that feeling when you wake up and you don't know where you are well I knew where I was but I'm going something's wrong something's different and then it hit me the sun is up 
this is the first time in 50 years that I hadn't woken up for a nightmare. I always woke up before before uh, the sun came up. Wow. And I haven't had, well, I still have bad dreams, but I haven't had the nightmares anymore. And this little girl, she stays on her side and I stay on my side. So I, I kind of fixed myself by accident. Yeah, stay on this side for a while, Mike. But yeah, that's I want to. Yeah, good. Yeah, I, I, I got married. At, I, I went on that trip in 2020 and fell in love. And two years later, went back and I got married. Uh, I can only stay a month. They're only granted a month visa. And I uh, went back again in um, basically September and honeymoon for a month. And can't wait to get back. <laughs> well, that's so terrific. We're yeah. going. The Veterans Breakfast Club is doing a trick a trip in uh, November, December, and really? Debbie Bussinger is, is who's on the Zoom room is uh, going on that trip. Yeah, it'll be our third trip with oh. veterans and others who want to go. Jeff and Shannon, I saw you, Shannon. I saw you waving your hand, yeah. but come on. You know, well, and I I have to say, I mean, first of all, we thank God for bringing us really to this story and this opportunity. Um, you know, we, it makes our hearts so happy to know that the stories that the sea wolves entrusted us with, you know, we made them a promise and every single one of them, and even our mobile riverine force soldiers and sailors, we made the same promise to them. And that was, we were going to protect, respect, and care for their story. Yeah. And I think, so that's, I, I hope they all feel like we have, and you know, we, we are so proud to be a part of it but without them entrusting us with this story then there would be no film and so i think that that means a lot but real quickly about the maintainers one thing i wanted to add and it just you know there's that moment that you'll just never forget we were in production and we were conducting interviews and i get into an elevator and it's kind of my job to shake hands right like i want to know who these sea wolves are and i remember this guy had a, a sea wolf hat on and i said you know my name is shannon and, and you are and he said well you don't you know i'm bob and i said hey bob i said what did you what did you do with the sea wolves and he said you don't want to talk to me and i said well what do you mean and he said well i was just a maintainer oh and i'll tell you like my heart fell into my yeah. stomach and i had tears in my eyes and i said no yeah, you want to grab them and shake them oh like just God. a maintainer. Yeah, absolutely. Your job was so important. Yeah. You need to know that. And we basically like strong armed him into coming yeah. and interviewing with us. We needed him to know that what he did mattered. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the interviews and what the pilots and the gunner said about the maintainers uh, changed the trajectory, at least this last stage of his life. He's walking oh perhaps you know That's so wonderful beautiful so. and the other thing about the film and i want to say this you know to the to everybody here is that it it strikes that perfect balance and it's not easy to strike between telling the very specific story of this very specific unit you know you have the the unusual setting of the mekong delta you have the uh, you know unusual equipment and problems that they that they encountered um but at the same time, capturing what's universal about war, about the bonds of combat, about what's serving in the military, you know, the bonds and the benefits and the burdens of serving in the military, that everybody, you know, who has served, who's in this room with us tonight, uh, has experienced a part of it and can relate to. And it, you just hear echoes. It's like every veteran's, our slogan is every veteran has a story. And when a veteran shares his or her story, you hear echoes of all the other stories that you've heard before, but it's a new look at it, new information, constantly learning. And it's just, you do it beautifully. Thank you so much for the, mm -hmm. I want to, do we have other sea wolves here? Yeah, Dick Barr. Dick. Okay. That's right. Uh, I think Dick doesn't have his camera I'm not, on. I'm not sure my camera is working correct, but I'm here. You are here, Dick. Tell us a little bit about your service. Well, I, I that was my first tour after getting my, receiving my wings. We got to Vietnam and went right out to detachment. And first thing you're really impressed with is the young guys. That are... Oh, hold on. We've getting some echo. I'm sorry about that. Keep going. 
Dick. So, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, that wasn't you. That was another uh, issue. Like kids like Barry. Barry's not a kid anymore, but he was a kid. He was 19 or 20, and he was a, a door gunner, a crew chief, and a maintainer at the same time. And those kids were just absolutely amazing. And it was very impressionable about us because we were, I was 26 at that time. And those kids were just six or seven years younger than us. And they were just amazing. So that was my first impression and probably my most lasting. How did you deal with the fear? I'm sorry. How did you deal with the fear on those missions? Uh, you don't think about the fear. <laughs> you just did your job as everybody in the film said, you just go out and do your job. And you were invincible those days when you were a young kid. <laughs> and it's like the one guy said, you go back to your bunk and say, Oh, I'm glad to be alive. And I guess you did that every time. I mean, every I was, time. I was shot down on my 11th month of my first tour and survived because of an army Army helicopter crew that picked us up and got shot up and a Navy SEAL that saved all of our lives. So I was very fortunate to Boy, uh, survive. That's a story. Mike, you had you have something to say. I just came back from an uh, honor flight and uh, oh, we get off the bus. We're, we're going into uh, the airport at San Diego and uh, there was a, a fire captain escorting me and he asked me something about the fear. And I said, well, uh, we ran out of bullets before we ran out of adrenaline because it wasn't like we're a B-17 crew going to Schweinfurt. You know, we're sitting around and all of a sudden it's Seawolf 80. This is Con Man 1. We have a scramble two boats and cockets and you're gone and you don't have time to be afraid. I was there were times I was afraid, but most of the time I was too busy. I was stunned by one of the veterans in the, or yeah, one of the vets in the film who said he, he went from asleep to flying in three minutes. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's hard to imagine. I have a question for you, Mike, your hat. Okay. That, that word at the top of your hat, H E L A T K. I've all, I've always wondered about what is that? Helicopter attack light squadron. That's the, that this is kind of a shortened version of it. It looks Greek. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a, okay. So it's a, it's a it's a shortened version of the helicopter attack squadron. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How do you say that word? I never say that word. Hell <laughs> <laughs> three or sea wolf. Oh, okay, good. I never say it. Thank you. So I'm not responsible for saying that word. That's good. Um, does anybody else else have Barry? You were you going to say something? Yeah, ask Dick about the last day of his second tour. Dick, you have the floor. Go ahead. At, my job was to ask you about, tell me yeah. about the last day. Of All your right. Second. Barry likes his story. I was uh, called back to the squadron as about my ninth month of my second tour. And Captain Mulcahy, he came back, I was a tactics officer, and, and my last week, Captain Mulcahy, he said, Dick, you're grounded. I said, what do you mean, Captain? He says, you're grounded. You survived this tour, you're grounded. Yes, sir, whatever you say. So in those days, you had to uh, you had to go to Saigon and do a, a P test before you could leave, leave Vietnam, which I don't know if you fail it, maybe you had to stay another year, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> I flew up to um, Dead 7 in Phu Loi with the squadron and uh, did my test at Tansanut. Came back to Dead 7 and waited my two days. The day I was supposed to leave, they said, hey, while you're here, can you do a fire team lead check for one of our pilots? I said, sure, that'd be okay. I can do that. So we went out and did this simulated fire team lead check. Well, in the middle of it, we got in a firefight and we did about four turnarounds, hot turnarounds, rearm, refuel, come back. And I'm looking at my watch. I said, I've got to leave here pretty quick. So anyway, we finally broke off the engagement and we flew, they flew me to Tansanut 
And on the way, I switched from my flight suit to my uniform and I got on the plane to come back to the States. So I was flying actually a combat mission within the last hour of my, of oh. my tour. And five years later, I told Captain Mulcahy about it. And Captain Mulcahy, being the warrior he was, he said, Dick, I would expect nothing less. Oh. <laughs> Great story. I want to hear from the Mobile Riverine vets. Harry, I see Harry Hahn is with us. He is, uh, I can't remember if he, are you the historian or the president? Oh, the I'm the president. The historian knows a hell, hell of a lot more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what are your memories? Do you remember the Sea Wolves? I just, I just, I just look good. The historian has all the history. Okay, you're the looks, uh, he's the brains. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's it. Okay. Yeah, well, what I'd like to say, first of all, is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the Sea Wolves supported us uh, tremendously. Uh, on the uh, in the Mobile Riverine Force, the uh, uh, the the bigger, heavier uh, boats that uh, that we had, and, and I was on a monitor, which is a 105 howitzer uh, floating tank, is what it was. And uh, uh, even though we had the heavy firepower, when we got in uh, real heavy firefights, we would call the Sea Wolves in. And, and, and in some cases, when we were alone on a couple of missions, that one of them I kind of call Mission Impossible. Um, the, uh, the only support we were to have if we got into a heavy, uh, a heavy firefight was, uh, a, a sea wolf squadron that would come out and support us. And they did on a couple occasions on that particular mission, uh, which was kind of interesting because I never realized until years later that one of the things we were doing, uh, on the uh, Cambodian border, uh, sneaking in the Cambodia there a little bit was to, uh, uh, throw 105 howitzer fire into the uh, training camp for the North Vietnamese and uh, VC inside Cambodia. It was the biggest uh, training camp that was inside Cambodia. So we were firing uh, what's called H and I fire in there on that mission. But uh, we were all by ourselves, just seven of us on that boat. And like I said, the only support we had were Sea Wolves uh, if we ran into uh, any trouble. But um, yeah, the uh, the Sea Wolves were uh, invincible. Uh, when I hear people talking about the adrenaline rush that you get of being in a firefight, I know all about that. Uh, your, your arms would tingle, your fingers would tingle uh, from the uh, uh, adrenaline until, uh, uh, you know, long after uh, the firefight and uh, when you were uh, kicking all the brass overboard that uh, you expended uh, utilizing the uh, automatic weapons that you were uh, firing. Uh, but uh, kudos to uh, not only the Sea Wolves, but to the Arbios for, uh, for producing such a, uh, a tremendous uh, documentary. Uh, we, uh, uh, of course, were so impressed with the Sea Wolf uh, documentary that we uh, uh, contracted the Arbios to do a, a documentary on the Mobile Riverine Force and are looking forward to a uh, uh, a documentary that uh, is not only equal to, but superior to this one. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we, no, no pressure. No pressure, you know, Jeff. No, no pressure at all. We yeah. Have, we have we have great expectations, and we know that uh, they're going to exceed our expectations. So, uh, thanks for having us on, and thanks for everyone who has supported and will support uh, the documentary. Uh, that is to be out uh, very soon, as soon as uh, all the edits and all the uh, uh, all the little uh, uh, um, things are done. I, and, and I don't understand it all. I yeah. don't understand it all. All, that, all the stuff that they do. Right. Jeff and Shannon's got to got to put all that together. Right. Right. And and Jeff and Shannon, could you again put in the chat, please, where people can get a copy of the DVD of Scramble the Sea Wolves if they sure. want a copy. I assume from your website or elsewhere and also how they could support the mobile riverine force documentary. Mike Harris, you are the historian uh, of the mobile riverine force. I believe. What do you remember the sea wolves? Well, I actually, uh, late 1968, we were on a, an operation down uh, South and rock jaw area and we had sea wolves covering us. At the time, and I, I actually did an audio tape, the only one I sent home, 
and uh, Seawolf 76 and 74 were the, the pilots. And uh, I believe 76 was a full commander. And uh, I did a search and I finally found him down in Coronado. Wow. And uh, he told me over the phone that he left Vietnam with nothing. And the, the film, I mean, the audio that I shared with him, he shared with his family and it was just, just a special, special time. But I've, I've lost uh, his name and everything. So maybe some of the SEALs can figure that out. And I'd be willing to share that, that uh, footage with him or the audio with them. Oh, how interesting. Wow. And you don't know his name? I can't remember. It's been 20 years ago since I made contact with him. Oh, boy. And you don't but, have a record of it anywhere. No. Oh, but, boy. Um, and secondly, you know, the Mobile River Force also had maintenance main, maintainers. Uh, we had ships in the main rivers, uh, repair ships, that when we'd go out in combat and get uh, beaten up and and uh, all that, we would uh, come back to these repair ships and they would uh, pick our boats out of the water, fix them all up, new engines, new screws, whatever we needed. But the problem with them was they got us back out in combat too fast. <laughs> they were good, just like, just <laughs> yeah, like were... the maintainers and the seawolves. And, right. You know, one thing too I have good. to interject here is, is, you know, you have the sea wolves, you have the mobile river force, you have the seals. All us Navy people are all proud of each other's unit as well. And know? that was so, that came so through in the documentary. I loved how you got that sense that even though the army is there giving you hand me downs and, and, you know, they're, they're, they have different uh, capacity for the missions. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a little bit of rivalry there. There's also like a deeper appreciation and love. Cliff Pfeiffer. You're a river rat. Yep, I sure am. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about the sea wolves? Well, you know, when you're in the well deck and uh, you're being shot at, you don't have time to look up and see what color the helicopter is uh, or the insignia. But uh, I think it was my first firefight and a uh, nice, bright, sunny afternoon. And before anything started, there was a rocket that took off that seemed like it was 20 feet above our boat and into the riverbank. And the whole time there was a helicopter over my boat and I didn't realize it. And uh, so I, I would venture to say that was one of the sea wolves. That was one of the sea wolves. And pardon my ignorance in asking this, but was there ever a time like, you know, where the sea wolves would come and, and you know, help out, maybe even rescue you? that you were able to kind of meet the crew and say thank you and talk about it? Or no, you just, you don't know really who they were or where they were, and maybe you never saw them again. No, never. Uh, I, I never had any uh, uh, chance to even learn about them. Uh, this is probably the most I've ever learned about them. Uh, you know, even though they were there and they were there for us, and I sure appreciate them, you know, being there. Isn't that remarkable? So there they were. I mean, you were serving right with them. They were there supporting you, and you really didn't know what their story was. Boy, and that's just another thing that just goes to show you that when you're in war, you know, your vision is <laughs> is like this. You're you're focused on your job, which is pretty harrowing. Um, how how fascinating. Uh, do we have other questions from people here in the room or questions or comments? from our other veterans, maybe. Um, oh, here we go, Rick. One thing that seems to fit with the conversation, about five or six years ago, I met a guy up at Sonoma Racetrack, and he was on a PBR, Brownwater Navy, and he got shot up bad. And it was a sea wolf that came in, hovered on the, the, the forward, uh, Folksel, the forward part of the, the boat, picked him up and medevaced him. And like I said, I met him five years ago. So he attributes his his life today to the Sea Wolves and the medevac people that saved him, medical people. Were the Navy Sea Wolf pilots that good? Yes. They were that I, good. I yes, flew with the skipper, man. He could fly the crap out of that helo. What is the difference? And I'm going to ask Jim Puhala if he wants to kind of tell us a little bit about this. 
um, I got the sense from the documentary that the that the Navy pilots were taught on instrumentation in a way that the Army pilots were not. Yeah, I don't know what the Navy pilots did. I know that uh, uh, Army pilots had very limited uh, night training. Uh, uh, and the instruments that we had on board were fairly limited as well. So, uh, you know, we were very limited as to what we could do at, at night. And, and I would imagine, Jim, that a, a night uh, mission would have been just awful. I, I just can't, I don't even know how it was accomplished. It's dark. <laughs> it's dark. Yeah, that's it. It's not like, it's not like flying around Pittsburgh at night. It's, it's really, really dark, rainy. And they're, they're being <laughs> well, I, I can tell you what you do is you follow the tracers. Because if, if the tracers are coming at you, you know where they're coming from. Wow. Boy, hey. oh boy. Todd, can I say something real quick here? Please, please. So just so everybody knows that that was the PBS version and there's a longer version which has Medal of Honor recipients in there. Navy Cross recipients. I'm, I'm sorry, Navy Cross recipients in there. And um, in fact, Barry Waluda, um, the story that Rick was talking about, I, it, it could be Barry Waluda's story, which I would love Barry to talk about his story for a minute. Barry? You yeah. have the floor. I'm not sure what Rick said, but uh, well, here's my story. Here's this patch here talking about trying to find the people that you support. Uh, yes. That, you know, one of our missions support that ship. It's called a lighter, it's a fuel. Uh, it carried fuel. And uh, we supported them one time and I put this patch on recently because I'd like to find some folks and talk to some people that we supported. <laughs> Can you name that unit again? Barry? Well, the ship is it was uh, the USS Kodiak, K O D E I A K. Uh-huh. It's YFR eight sixty six. YFR dash eight six six. Okay. And I would like to find some people that served on that. Okay, got uh, it. I, I actually met the skipper in Denver, I don't know, 15 years ago. And uh, it, was, it was interesting talking to him because we medevaced the man off that boat. And I always wondered what became of him, if he survived or not. He survived. He, yeah. Larry Kilmeyer, another Navy uh, Vietnam veteran, asks here in the chat, did you get any R and R, and if so, where did you go? Australia oh, Pat, here. Australia. Yeah. So why did you choose Australia, Pat? I took Australia because I wanted to go. Believe it or not, I figured Hawaii was for married guys to meet their wives. Yep. And I wanted to see some put it bluntly, some round-eyed women. I didn't want to see any more <laughs> Oriental women. That's what we love about our Veteran Breakfast Club here. It's, you know, it's a uh, conversation. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Barry? Where'd you go? I went to Australia also. Okay. I, I figured I'd probably never get a chance to see that part of the world again. And lo and behold, I just come back from there. Uh, about a month ago, my wife and I, I liked it so much, I wanted the, my wife to experience it also, so we just did a little trip there. <laughs> hey, this is Dick. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. You know, Jeff brought it up about Barry, about the rescue off the boat. Barry kind of downplayed that, but he did, he did an amazing job. The person was wounded. Jim Walker was the pilot. Barry was the door gunner in the starboard side. We came alongside, hovered on the bow of the ship. Fight, the ship was under fire, taking fire, and, and Barry got out of the bird and drug the wounded person aboard our helicopter while we're taking fire and we're getting mortared at the same time. So Gary, Barry kind of downplayed that, but he was he received a silver star for his efforts on that mission. A silver star? Yes. And Jim Walker received a Navy Cross. 
Whoa. It was quite it was quite an adventure that what he did. And as we were, we finally got the person aboard the aircraft. And Jimmy Walker, the pilot, was starting to lift off. And Barry says, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, this this toe of the skid is underneath the stanchion of the chain on the ship. And if we had tried to lift off, we'd have flipped over and gone underneath the ship. But Barry did a great job of talking Jimmy Walker down and say, down, aft, down, aft, back up. And we finally got out of there. And Barry told me later, he said, while all this is going on, we figure we're going to get hit and go in the water. And Barry had the presence of mind to think, let's see, I got my chicken plate on. If we go underneath the boat, I'll leave my chicken plate on my chest until I clear the propeller of the ship. <laughs> and once I get clear, I'll take out the uh, chicken plate and then I can come to the surface. All uh, this is while we're taking fire. So Barry kind of downplayed that, but he was quite a hero on that, on that mission. You know, another thing about the film, I, I've never seen the position of the door gunner be explained more clearly and thoroughly. Uh, and the problems with, of course, the jamming of the gun that could always happen, how you clear it, and the the unusual way that you held Barry, the M60. I don't know if you had, you used an M60 main, mainly or a... Yeah, yeah, it was a handheld M60. As a matter of fact, uh, when you fire about anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000 rounds, and we didn't use earplugs then, I found it very interesting when I went to, to the VA and tried to get a claim in for hearing. And they said, I had told a doctor one time, I, I rode my motorcycle. So as it turned out, it wasn't the gun, it was the motorcycle that yeah. became the issue. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Story. I have the letter on here somewhere. Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> John, John yeah. real quick, that, that's what I was talking about. Barry's story is in the Blu-ray, the extended version. Right. So th those stories are in the Blu-ray. In the Blu-ray. If I can add something that made me think about it also is I'll never forget, Barry, um, the night of the premiere, your beautiful wife came up to Jeff and I and gave us the biggest hug because it wasn't until that night that she had actually heard Barry's story and how he received a commendation. And with that even being said, Mike Madrid's son came up with us also, and he had never heard that story about his dad and the little girl. And it kind of makes me tear up just thinking about that because this story is about the soldiers and the sailors of the Mulder River Force and the sea wolves and every veteran has this contribution and this tremendous personal sacrifice that their families may not know anything about. And so we took this opportunity to celebrate that. And so there's just like this ripple effect. And so families know now what their dads did or what their husbands did yeah. during the war. And, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I got pretty emotional on Vietnam War Veterans Day and I posted this video and, I was just kind of reminded of that parable about the little boy that's on the the ocean and there's a, a big storm that washes up hundreds of thousands of starfish and this old man sees this little boy tossing these starfish in the water and he approaches him he's like what are you doing you know you're never you know what are you doing and he said well I, i'm saving these starfish and he said young man you're never going to make a difference and he picked up one starfish and he threw it in the ocean and he said i made a difference for that one for that one and for us, you know, I look at who's here tonight and the work we're doing again with our Seawell family and the Mobile Rivering Force. And we hope that just in a little bit, in a small way, God's using us to make a difference for them. And, and you know, the conversation that we just had tonight is makes a difference to so many people who are part of the conversation. Again, people like me who haven't served. Uh, you know, who, who very young during the Vietnam war and, uh, but it's such an education and it's such an inspiration. And after a conversation like this, I, you know, if, if I have a bad day tomorrow, it'll be a little easier to get, to get through really the, realizing that I'm not dealing with a uh, jammed M60, you know, while I'm under fire. Um, One yeah. More thing. 
One more thing I'd like to say about the film, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, we were on detachments that in some cases were 12, maybe 20 or fewer people. And this film introduced me in a sense to many more Seawolves. And I'm, I'm kind of, believe it or not, a, a sort of a little shy. <laughs> but uh, when I, after I saw the film, I go up and I say, you know, I learned a little bit about the person. I felt like I knew them and I would actually start a conversation with somebody, something I rarely do. <laughs> that great Pat. Yes. I know we're getting short on time, but when we were talking about families, I would like Jeff and Shannon to explain how the documentary got started. Yes, Shannon, family relation, correct? Your father? Yeah, my dad was in the movie. His name is Joe Crutcher, and he was a maintainer. And uh, he went to be with the Lord in November of 2021. But not unlike a lot of our veterans and their families, I never knew what my dad did during the war. I mean, all I know is he was a plank owner and there was this big plaque on the wall growing up. And that's really about the extent of it. And then I'll kind of like pass the baton because <laughs> Jeff was at my parents' house. And anyway, my dad got him to show up at a special event. And <laughs> Yeah, her dad, her dad was really good at getting people to do things. Um... <laughs> Uh, pretending like he was, he was persuasive pretending like he was asking a question but then really trying to get you to do something you know so he, i was watching a football game at their house and he kept coming in the room going man i wish there was some way i could remember this thing that i'm doing with my vietnam group then he'd walk out and come back in oh i wish there was a way and he knew that i was a you know cinematographer and director and stuff and so I, Shannon finally said, I think my dad wants you to go shoot this thing that he's doing with his Vietnam buddy. Yeah, to film it, right. Yeah. Right, go we film it. So, but wouldn't come out and just ask. <laughs> right. I really didn't know what it was because I had no idea what her dad was involved in. And then uh, Gary Eli, who's on here, had called me, I think, the night before and kind of said, oh, can you do some interviews after with some of the guys? And I said, oh, sure. And I was honestly thinking when we were going to get there, it was going to be like 10 guys in a circle talking because I had no concept. He didn't tell, uh, Joe didn't tell me, she right. didn't tell me what it was. So of course we get there and there's, I think maybe 600 people there. And, and it was a tribute to the 44 fallen brothers who didn't make it back. So luckily I had just come back from a surf trip filming. So I had both cameras. And so Shannon and I set up both cameras and we started filming. And then when they started talking about all the rescues that they did, I was like, wow, these guys sound amazing. And then what really got me was uh, one of the Navy yes. SEALs had come up and talked about, oh, um, who rescues uh, sea wolves or who rescues Navy SEALs? And I, I thought in my mind, like nobody. And he goes, nobody, right? Yeah. And then he said, wrong. Sea wolves rescued us. And if it wasn't for those guys, I wouldn't be here today. And many of us SEALs wouldn't be here. And then immediately in my head, I went, what? I, I got I to gotta do a documentary on these guys. Isn't that, that amazing? popped into my head. And so talked to Shannon's dad, Joe. Joe talked to Gary Eli. Gary Eli talked to Mike Dobson, who was the president. <laughs> who might even be on this and then, call. Yeah. And, you know, here's the other thing that I want to say real quick is Shannon and I look at these guys. They're like, they are, they are family to us. You know, the Mobile River Rainforest guys, the Sea Wolves, they're not our friends. They're our family. So. Like, it's a special project every time we do something. Oh, how terrific. Um, yeah, and, I, and to me, they're 10 feet tall, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just always will be. Yeah. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you, Jeff and Shannon, for sharing the film and for the veterans to share their stories. I know, you know, we've left a lot of stories on the table here. Please do feel free, every one of you, to join us again, if you'd like, anytime. Our next program will be Monday night, our VBC happy hour at 7 p.m. Eastern. It'll be, uh, all of you should be able to get the email that I'll send out reminding people about the program. We're going to have a Navy veteran on from a, a Korean War veteran, Bud Mendenhall, uh, 92 years old, and he's going to share his story of the Navy battles of uh, of, of Korea, the Korean War. Please do join us if you can. Thank you again. Thank you, Jeff and Shannon. Thanks to all of you. Good night and uh, good weekend.